On the ninth day of October, Halloween gave to me nine priests a miracling, eight Jerry's vamping, seven Jody's oinking, six body swapping, five reeds a wolfing, four drunken uncles, three werewolf colonies, two spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Hey everyone, welcome back to the 31 Days of Halloween. The first week is now solidly uh, in the books, and we are up to uh, the 9th of October, where we are going to be discussing the newest thing we're going to talk about because it just came out. Uh, Fair warning, there will be spoilers as we discuss the new Mike Flanagan joint that dropped on Netflix entitled Midnight Mass. So, if you have not yet seen Midnight Mass, I encourage you to do so. Um, We're going to be talking about the first three episodes, which feels like a natural breaking point uh, today. And then tomorrow we'll be talking about the last four. So, if you haven't seen it, um, as of right now, I would tell you to do so. I haven't seen the last four yet as I record this. I've only seen the first three to keep everything kind of fresh in mind. But I would recommend it. And, uh, you know, uh, catch back up uh, or skip these until you've seen it. Uh, And then back on October 10th, I'm sorry, October 11th, uh, we will be back to doing the usual shenanigans. So uh, not the (laughs) shaflanigans, shenanigans. Um, Shaflanigans, of course, the roundtable show that I did with uh, Duncan McLeish and Jamie Sammons, um, all about... Uh, the work of Mike Flanagan, who I'm a big fan of. I think Mike Flanagan is a terrific director. Um, So let me say my piece about that, and then we'll talk about Midnight Mass. Uh, I think that Mike Flanagan is is sort of the heir apparent to John Carpenter. Uh, Somebody else had had named another director, and and because I'm old and my brain don't work so good, uh, I can't quite recall who it was that they compared him to, uh, because the idea that he is the new Carpenter is so fixed in my brain, I just will not allow for another comparison. Um, but I, I do, I think he's a consistently very good to great director, has an understanding of character and horror that is very rare. In fact, I would think, I, w- I would say that the, the thing that separates John Carpenter from Mike Flanagan is that Mike Flanagan um, sort of knows how to dig into character in a way that is more Stephen King esque. Uh, oh, Frank Darabont. Frank Darabont is is the person that uh, uh, someone compared Flanagan to, and I would agree with that to an extent. But I think Flanagan weirdly lacks the sentimentality of Frank Darabont. Uh, when you look at something like The Green Mile or uh, The Shawshank Redemption or uh, what was the the one, The Majestic? Was that the Darabont film where uh, Jim Carrey uh, was uh, was in that one? At any rate, I, I feel like those are far more sentimental films than Flanagan does. I think Flanagan has more of a mean streak in him. Um, although you can argue that The Haunting of Hill House, which was the last big project that Flanagan directed, he d- he definitely had plenty of uh, hand in The Haunting of Bly Manor, which came out in 2020, and we talked about that last year in the 31 Days of Halloween. But Haunting of Hill House, um, as, as sentimental as that show got, especially towards the end... I do think that it also had a little bit of nastiness to it. And I I think most of his movies are like that. I think Absentia is like that. I think, um, you know, Oculus is certainly kind of mean spirited. I think Dr. Sleep has a little bit of sentimentality, uh, to it, but that is again, sort of the nature of adapting King. But yeah, Flanagan's not afraid to be, mean spirited and and that's what I, I kind of respect about him and that's why I think maybe Carpenter is a better comparison even though Flanagan clearly lives in that Stephen King territory where 
you take a, an ordinary group of people, an ordinary family, an ordinary person, and then you whip a little of the supernatural on them, and that's the catalyzing factor that uh, sort of brings people's true natures to life and so forth. And Midnight Mass is no different. Midnight Mass is a, an incredibly character-driven piece. Um, as I said, we're only going to talk about the first three episodes, but we're going to talk in some detail about those three episodes. So uh, if you don't want anything spoiled, by all means, bail now. This is your last warning. Um, so the first three ep episodes re reveal to us, the viewer, the uh, characters in... Uh, a little town, a, a dying fishing village uh, called Crockett Island that is uh, referred to as the Crock Pot by the natives. It uh, It is sort of framed around the character of Riley, who is uh, a man who, at the beginning of the very first episode, has been involved in a car accident where he was driving drunk uh, gets into an accident and his passenger is killed and uh, he goes to jail for a few years um, and when he comes out he returns home to Crockett Island with his his family mother and father uh, are are sort of devout Catholics um, he's got a younger brother the uh, father played by uh, Henry Thomas of uh, haunting of, of Hill House fame and as well as E.T., I suppose, is the thing that Henry Thomas will always be known for. But, uh, yeah, Henry Thomas is a little less crazy about the idea of his his son returning home after uh, th this terrible accident where, you know, his, his son was responsible for the, the loss of, of this young woman's life. And the, the mother, much more excited, uh, Riley comes home uh, to see an old flame of his um, named Aaron uh, played by Kate Siegel the uh, wife slash partner I'm not sure if, if they're actually married I think they're married uh, of Mike Flanagan and she is the local school teacher who uh, has returned home uh, after the death of her mother who was an alcoholic uh, we learn um, and she is sort of taking up her mother's house, taking up her mother's job, uh, and, and trying desperately not to be her mother while also, um, about to give birth to uh, a child. Um, some other returning characters from Haunting of Hill House, we have Annabeth Gish as the local, uh, doctor who is caring for her mother. Um, her mother also is suffering from, uh, dementia, just a, you know, an old woman and it, it happens. And, um, we have, uh, one of the returning actors from Haunting of Bly Manor, an actor by the name of Rahul Kohli, uh, who plays the, the local sheriff. He is the only Muslim on the island, um... Uh, and, and is a little out of place because he's kind of one of the few non-white people uh, on, on the island uh, other than uh, there's Dolly who's a woman of color and in a, in a mixed race relationship with uh, her husband who is the mayor of the town um, they have a daughter named Lisa who is in a wheelchair uh, there's Ra uh, Sheriff Hassan is Rahul Kohli's uh, character uh, his son, Ali, who is, you know, trying to fit in with everyone. And um, then kind of rounding out the main characters uh, are Hamish Linklater, who plays uh, Father Paul um, and is uh, kind of the, the central character outside of Riley, I would say. And then you have Robert Longstreet, who plays a guy named Joe uh, Colley. And Joe Colley um, is related to the the daughter, Lisa, by virtue of the fact that during a drunken accident where he was shooting his gun, he accidentally shoots Lisa and paralyzes her, leaves her in a wheelchair. And so there are all these dynamics at play. Uh, worth pointing out the character of Bev Keen, uh, played, by, played by Samantha Sloyan, 
um, who is sort of the local busybody and may have embezzled some money from uh, some of the locals. And, and so to set the stage even further, I know I'm being long-winded about the setup, but again, this is this big seven-hour story. And much like Dr. Sleep and much like The Haunting of Hill House and much like The Haunting of Bly Manor, um, this is a story about all these characters and their relationships to one another and um, sort of their their internal struggles and so forth. So there's a lot of stage setting in the first few episodes. Uh, so the, the town itself, uh, or the island itself, is in sharp decline. There had been an oil spill a few years before, and uh, during a, a settlement phase where the company that created this environmental disaster was like, hey, uh, we'll just pay you guys. They don't uh, give the amount of money, but a, a substantial payout, and uh, we'll just call it a day instead of, you know, uh, bothering to clean up everything and, and make make your lives sustainable again by fishing because we have essentially polluted the, the hell out of uh, the waters around your island. And so a lot of people took this payout, and a lot of people left the island, and so when we pick up the show, what we're seeing is the, the remains of that. Uh, these people who have stayed or returned to this island following the, this event for one reason or another. And also returning to the island is Father Paul, the, the character uh, played by Hamish Linklater, who is a visiting priest who is taking the place of the old and somewhat addled uh, Monsignor who had uh, been leading this parish and had gone on a journey to the Holy Land on, on a trip to the Holy Land uh, the, the Father Paul shows up and says yeah yeah he got real sick he's staying on the mainland I'm here for a few weeks um, to make sure that the parish continues and to serve uh, in his stead until he is able to return and so again, one of the the thrusts of the show is the character of Riley, who has come home. Uh, he is looking for redemption. Of course, he's he's sort of lost. Um, he feels this incredible weight of guilt for what he has done, as evidenced by this vision he has of the woman he killed. It's a really unsettling image of the girl that was in the car with him, uh, with m bits of mirror embedded in her flesh as he lays down to sleep at night that is what he sees uh, with with blue and red lights flashing reflecting off of uh, these mirrors it's really eerie imagery and Mike Flanagan uh, no stranger to creating a spooky ghost or two has managed to do it again here but this is not a ghost story um, weirdly we talked about Fright Night recently and this has more in common with Fright Night than Haunting of Hill House in a lot of ways. In that this is ultimately, it seems, kind of a vampire story. Although uh, it, it is a little bit of a different kind of vampire story. Um, again, the, in very Stephen King fashion, we establish all these characters and, and their inner struggles. And set against this backdrop, Father Paul comes to this uh, the, this failing Catholic church in town and is uh, a little vibrant. He's young. He's, uh, you know, full of vim and vigor. And in the course of the show, uh, as I have seen it thus far, um, as he essentially uh, performs a miracle. He, he has Lisa the young girl that was shot and paralyzed, uh, come out of her chair and she can walk again. And, you know, how on earth did this happen? And it creates this, you know, kind of fervor around the church. All of a sudden, every, everyone's going to church now. In the meantime, Father Paul is also conducting um, AA sessions, uh, Alcoholic Anonymous uh, sessions with Riley. And we're you know, forging this relationship between the two of them and maybe my favorite bits of the show. And here's where I'm going to uh, perhaps get a little personal. My, uh, some of my favorite bits of the show are 
these discussions about addiction and faith that Riley and Father Paul have. And I think it's because uh, as I've gotten older and, uh, you know, dealt with addiction issues in my life, not so much myself, but certainly had a number of family members um, for whom addiction was a real struggle. And this show kind of deals with that in a, in a fairly honest way. It's, it doesn't sugarcoat anything, but it also looks at addiction from a couple of different points of view, as well as addiction treatment, which I also have very strong opinions about. And in a lot of ways, Riley is sort of the voice in my own head as he uh, kind of critiques the idea that you need to have faith to treat addiction. And that leads to conversations about the nature of faith and what the role of God is in people's lives. And for people of faith, what does that look like? Um, how, how do you square that? How do you square something like a miracle of a girl getting out of her chair uh, that she was doomed to for her entire life with the idea that you know, across the water on the mainland, uh, the sheriff Hassan uh, has a great, a, a great speech about this, where he talks to his son about being a Muslim and saying, you know, we believe in in God to be sure, but what about the God that also took your mother away from us, and that he should choose to save? this girl but not another girl on the mainland who's dying of brain cancer or you know somebody who dies in a car accident or whatever like what is what is the nature of a god that can allow that kind of decision making to happen Th that sort of randomness of of the miraculous and uh and that is a thing that is discussed in in some detail and earnestly on the show and not always with a clean answer, uh, at least certainly in the early goings, but it, it is something that I have personally wrestled with, um, whether or not I believe in a higher power. And if I believe in a higher power, then like I said, how do you square that with, uh, the suffering that goes on in the world? And, um, how, how do you build faith around your own doubt? And, uh, that's kind of the the real magic trick of this show and what Mike Flanagan has done here is to address these really core and very personal uh, kinds of, of questions and stories and uh, and turned it into something that's not only entertaining but you know there's a scene uh, between Joe Colley and Lisa where um, she goes after coming out of the chair where she goes to his house to forgive him and hand like tip of the hat to uh, Robert Longstreet the, the guy who plays Joe Colley his performance is so heartbreaking uh, but that scene had me in tears you know because it's something that you think about a lot like a you know, if you've ever done anything that has wronged someone and carried that guilt with you, it doesn't have to be as extreme as as something like, you know, paralyzing a, a poor little girl who certainly didn't deserve it. It can be anything. It can, it can be, you know, like life is random and, and frequently cruel. And we often do things unthinkingly that have this impact on others. And... So how do you make that okay? How do how do you get your redemption from that? And this show addresses some of that, and 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 the scenes where it does, like I said, are just absolutely heartbreaking, and and really well done and really well acted. Um, you know, I I would say that the Bev, uh, Keen character has a little bit of Mrs. Carmody in her. Uh, as the character who witnesses the miraculous and um, immediately think, starts evangelizing and so forth. Uh, the other thing, here's the big secret of the show, and it's something that you'll sniff out pretty early on, 
if you're like me. And I'm glad that already in episode three, this is why I wanted to, to stop at the third episode and have this conversation, is in, in, at this point in the story, we have gotten the revelation of kind of what's really at work here. Not so much the miracles, although I, you know, I think there's a pretty good idea of what's going on with that. But it's that Father Paul, the young man returning to uh, Crockett Island and, and inspiring all these people, is in fact the Monsignor, the old man who went away. And it turns out while he was on his trip to the Holy Land, he got lost in this sandstorm, got separated from the group, wound up in this old, you know, uh, ruin that had been buried under the sand. And there uh, ran afoul of what he refers to as an angel, but it's a creature that drank his blood and then fed its own blood to the Monsignor, um, reversing the effects of time. He woke up a young man rejuvenated. And as the third episode of the show ends, not only does he confess this uh, to no one, he but he tells us, the audience, uh, what's going on, but he is also... Um, starting to feel some negative effects of perhaps drinking the blood of this so-called angel who he has brought back to the island. And I presume that, you know, what we are going to get on the back end of this season is uh, a bit more of horror than what we got in the first three episodes. I mean, there's some spooky stuff here and there and, uh, you know, things to keep the action moving. But this is the the first three episodes have been much more character building and world building and understanding these relationships and setting the stage for these miracles and um and 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 you know letting us in on the dark secret of Father Paul, which is that he is not really Father Paul, um and that probably uh, because we have seen him fi- filling the. The bottles, I can't remember exactly what they're called because I, you know, it's been a long time since I, I was in a Catholic church. But uh, the bottles from which the the, the sacrament of wine is poured, um, filling it with his own little flask, which to me suggests that what he is doing is feeding the people of town with uh, the blood of this angel or his own, one or the other. Either way, blood that has been tainted. Um, the, the early effects of this is that everybody in town is feeling better and getting healthier and, you know, the little girls are, are getting out of their chair, but the only person who isn't taking the sacrament is Riley, who is having this crisis of faith, as well as, you know, some other people in town who are not practicing Catholics, but it's very clear, like, oh, at some point this is gonna, like, everybody in this town's gonna be a vampire, and coming after uh, the people who have not been tainted, and I'm looking forward to that. Like that, I, I think that's going to be really scary, and I think that's going to be good. But I'm almost afraid that the show is going to turn its back. And I trust Mike Flanagan, so you know we'll see. Where we'll do tomorrow, you will know the end result of my thoughts on this. But as will I. But I'm worried that we're going to lose some of the humanity and and some of the difficult conversations about faith and addiction and and responsibility and redemption and guilt and all the stuff that makes this story so rich to me. Um, Not that it isn't going to be fun. I just hope, and, and again, in Flanagan I trust, so this is probably... Uh, just, uh, you know, a complaint about a thing that hasn't happened yet in a show that I tend to really like. So, I, I don't know. I'm that That's my only concern, is that it's going to sacrifice humanity for horror in the, in the back end of this show. But I absolutely adore it. Um, I think that it is much like Doctor Sleep was, much like Haunting of Hill House was, it's like settling into a good book. It's got a lot of characters. There's a lot of texture to them. Um, you know, I can kind of tell you little bits about everyone uh, that, hey, maybe Annabeth Gish's mother had this sort of, if not an affair, certainly this relationship with the Monsignor 
um, that you can kind of see in their interaction. Um, there's a great moment where her mother, who's been suffering from dementia, and is getting this daily communion from uh, Father Paul, where she kind of wakes up and, you know, is, you know, her daughter, Annabeth Gish, uh, uh, thinks that she's just you know, out of her gourd again is, and is out wandering and, and potentially going to hurt herself. And her mother knows her and says like, I, I can't believe like where, how I feel like I've been somewhere dark for a long time and they just embrace. And it's the first time that she's able to talk to her mother who she's been caring for, but that hasn't been really her mother. And, and it's filled with moments like that or, um, you know, uh, Kate Siegel uh, talking about her very cattily kind of talking to the character of Bev Keen about her mother. Like Bev has this real high opinion of, of her mother and, and is comparing um, Kate Siegel's Aaron to this now dead mother and uh, about how, uh, you know, how fr- Bev is saying like, oh, your mother was so frugal. She would uh, she would use water to cut the the windex she would never waste a thing and uh and kate siegel's response is well when she got home she wasted a lot of bottles you know what i'm saying and and so there are these like you the dynamics of the town are so good and so well thought out and so well fleshed out and you kind of understand like sheriff hassan is new to the island and because he's Muslim and because he's new, he's not entirely trusted. And at a point where Bev Keen wants to start handing Bibles out to all the students on the island on account of all the miracles happening, they have this kind of small town meeting where Sheriff Hassan is like, hey, this is kind of bullshit. Like, if I did this with the Quran, you guys would be pissed. And, you know, how quickly that is dismissed by this town that's just caught up in this fervor of, uh, of sort of godliness. And it, it, but none of that is super ham fisted, you know, it, it's done with a light enough touch that it doesn't ever feel, uh, like it's being didactic, like Flanagan's climbing on a soapbox. And in a, in a lot of moments, it feels like Flanagan as, as one of the main writers, there are other writers on the show, but he's directed all of these so far that he's sort of saying like, Hey, there aren't a lot of easy answers when you're, when you're talking about things as big as faith, then, and, and I don't mean just faith in a thing. I mean, the idea of religious faith that it's complicated. Uh, it's not something that offers a lot of easy answers. And I'm, I'm interested to see where this show goes with that sort of internal conversation that the show is having with the audience. You can certainly see where the redemption for Riley is going to come and, and, Joe Colley himself uh, has had his own kind of redemption. And there's a a great scene where they talk, uh, Joe Colley and Riley talk about uh, being alcoholics and, you know, uh, talking about whether or not that gets better or it just gets different. And and that kind of thing, it's it's a really well-considered show, as you would expect from someone like Mike Flanagan, who has worked in long form enough at this point that he kind of has a feel for how to keep the story moving, but also when to slow things down and, and just let the characters talk to one another. And that's the stuff I enjoy most in this show so far. The vampire stuff, uh, is fun, uh, to be sure. And I'm, I'm excited to see things get nastier. Uh, we're at the turning point in the show where now that we've revealed what's going on, uh, I feel like this is just going to get, uh, darker and and meaner, but also I'm excited to see where all the all all, all the more philosophical threads of this show, uh, how that stuff plays out. So um, that is that is it. That is uh, a fairly long winded look at the first three episodes of Midnight Mass. But hey, tomorrow uh, should be a little shorter, even though we're talking about more episodes. But now we've talked about all the characters. You know who they are. Uh, we know their relationships, and and the setup is done, so we can just talk about uh, the the dirty business of vampiring on Crockett Island. Which, now that I say it out loud, uh, it sure might be a reference to Salem's Lot and Larry Crockett, 
Um, I, I There is definitely some Salem's Lot in this, where you're taking a small town and inserting a vampire, and potentially a vampire plague. That's really what I expect to start see happening, is all these people who are taking this tainted communion 